Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we'll get started now um, to the session on working together to create a sustainable ecology for open access books. Um, my name is Peter Potter. Uh, I'm publishing director at Virginia Tech and uh, visiting program officer for the ARL for Tome uh, toward an open monograph ecosystem. And um, um, I have some, a chance probably during the talk to, or during this session to, to say a few words about that. But um, to start, um, what we want to talk about today um, is open, open access monographs. Um, the, the idea being they are here to stay, but we are still far away from a sustainable ecology. Um, some of the key themes we want to discuss are here. Um, technical metadata standards, discoverability, impact and usage, um, the global situation, and the always thorny problem of the funding question. Um, our panel, uh, we have a, a really distinguished panel here. We have at the end Steve Allen, Vice President of Americas and Strategic Partnerships for De Gruyter. Um, Carolyn Morris, um, Executive VP for Higher Education at Biblio Labs. Amy Pawlowski, um, Deputy Director, uh, Ohio Link. Um, and oh, Ruth. Ruth Jones, Director of Global Sales, Digital Services, Ingram Content. And to my left, Brian O'Leary, Executive Director of the Book Industry Study Group. Um, so for the session, um, we've set things up so that um, you can go to uh, Mentimeter uh, at menti.com. Um, use the code given here, and if you um, will have some questions that you can respond to, or if you have um, questions as well, you can raise them there, right? Yeah, at the end. At the end, okay. And um, to begin, oh, let me just give you a sense of the ground rules here. So we're not going to have potted discussion or potted presentations. We want to get right into the discussion. So we'll start with uh, some uh, prompt questions and get right into the discussion. And if you have questions along the way, um, I don't know how that will work without the microphone. Um, but if, if there, you have immediate questions, um, I think you can ask. But we'll wait and at the end have uh, more open questions. So, um, so if you go to menti.com, um, we want to get a sense of who is in our audience today. Um, and maybe is a. So, um, librarians, publishers, product service suppliers, others? Yes, All right. Okay, so everyone gets to vote, well, to identify themselves. Six, three, six, eight, six, eight. Uh, no. Hey, consortia peeps, did you pick librarian or other? <laughs> librarian. <laughs> I wonder what other, what constitutes other here. <laughs> All right, well, that's a pretty good mix, I would say. Um, oh, not still going. <laughs> I think somebody's gaming the system. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, to begin, we just to give a little bit of background. Uh, Carolyn will um, say a few words um, about again just uh, background and context. Hi, my name is Carolyn Morris. I uh, work for a small software company that's actually based 
um, right here in Charleston, South Carolina. So I feel very fortunate to be able to come here a couple times a year instead of just once. Um, and what we do, what our work is really, is helping um, connect libraries with OA content. So um, we are a platform provider in that handy little hole that we just did. And in our work doing that, um, what we've encountered um, really has spoken to us about just the lack of standards, both for information and files coming into the system at, that are open access in the monograph space, and expectations for what we should be outputting, both in terms of metadata and in terms of usage statistics. So since we've had this experience, and we want to make make it easy and affordable and sustainable for libraries and OA content to be connected, we see real value in a community conversation around what are the standards and infrastructure that's needed so that we can make all of the workflows sustainable. So today, um, there, if you go to the Directory of Open Access Books, this was actually probably a week ago, we, had, we were at just over 21,000 open access monographs. Um, and those are the ones that have registered with Directory of Open Access Books and put their, put their content up there. Which is, a, um, you know, that, that batch of content has, re has a um, good pedigree. And there's probably other stuff out there that has also been peer reviewed and is high quality open access content that's not counted in that. But we can say, you know, this is a substantial body of content now, right? That is being produced open access in an open access monograph format. So it's here to stay. When we talk about open access in our, um, in, at a lot of conferences and in the literature, it's been referring to open access articles, um, but we're thinking it's time to really take a serious look at the infrastructure for open access books. Um, so even though in a lot of ways it seems like, oh, isn't this just another ebook? If you think about all of the systems that we have in place as publishers, as aggregators, as libraries, a lot of those workflows are based around the purchase, right? So if you're a librarian and you want to get an ebook, frequently the way you would get that ebook is to put an order record into your library management system and place an order and then receive back the whole metadata record and pay for that object and pay for that item and that would be how you got your metadata and that all disappears in this open access world. So we know um, that there's some research and we there's a bibliography at the end of the slides here that will be available as well as some handouts here of some recent research that really indicates that a lot of the open access monographs are not in fact making it into a library catalog. So that's one of the things we want to address today. In addition, funding, um, everybody knows we can talk about funding for open access for weeks and weeks, um, but certainly an issue, discoverability, again, because if things aren't going into your systems in the way they always have, what are the new ways going to be to get those into library systems? Um, to make sure that users can find them there and not just through Google or searching outside um, the university ecosystem. Um, metadata standards, usage statistics standards, um, all of these things are the items that we want to address today. Um, the other piece that I think we we'll get to with some of the questions towards the end is just that this is happening in a global context, right? So frequently, even though we're in the U.S. and it doesn't necessarily impact us, we hear about Plan S and what the Europeans are doing in terms of open access and how that's going to impact workflows in the, in the U.S. And whereas much of research today is global, to say, oh, it doesn't matter to us because we're in the U.S., it doesn't impact us, our, our researchers aren't under the same um, restrictions, that in fact most of them are collaborating globally and they are going to face those same restrictions. So it's really an issue that we feel is timely and we have to deal with now. Um, and the way we, originally this was supposed to be a lively lunch session, and so um, we had planned it in a way to say, hey, we want to bring people in and have people talk. And so, 
Um, we're glad you all passed the who you are questions because the rest of this, I think, is going to be mostly questions. And again, just the bibliography here. These are some of the things that, that I read, that the group who's in the panel here has been familiar with, um, and uh, really good resources, research that's come out in the last year, year and a half, related specifically to open access monographs rather than open access. Yeah, not that and for anybody who's interested, we have copies of the uh, reports, uh, the digital science report, um, the state of open monographs, which came out earlier this year. Uh, thanks to the folks um, from digital science for bringing those along, um, Kathy Holland. Um, so let's start some questions. So a good a good question to, to start with is really a definitional one, which is um, what is the information supply chain and why does it matter? Who would like to tackle that first? I'll do it. Um, <laughs> right? I know there's a slide after here which is very uh, insightful. I think when we talk about this ebook supply chain, the, the challenge, as Carolyn said, is that. Um, when people have thought about open access, they haven't always thought about the supply chain that needs to be in place. And if the content creators, the publishers are creating paid for content, um, open access content, you can't have two different system supply chains working against each other. You have to try and streamline it. So I come from England Content Group, we're very much about how you move content from one place to another. We work with um, lots of different types of publisher. But I think really the supply to the mic a little okay. more. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah okay. We're just competing with next door. Uh, yeah, we can't do the whole come on down and, and <laughs> <laughs> we realized it was gonna be hard and we didn't have the music, so sorry for that. Um I'll just, I've usually got that. Should we take it off? Yeah. yeah, this thing is right, so we really are gonna do the come on down. Yeah. Okay. All right. There we go. Put that down. Is that the Yes. Okay, great. Um so really the supply chain is about the, the, the movement of the content that's within the book, within the monograph for the purpose of this, and how it gets into the hand of the user through the library. Um, typically when we talk about the supply chain, that tends to be in the context of a retailer, but it's the same thing in terms of the content comes, it's reviewed, it's, it's put into some sort of a platform, and then it is consumed. But how are we going to make that work? efficiently, I think, is one of the challenges um, as we move in this transitional um, marketplace. I'll build on the, um, the what's, I guess, shown as the purple uh, arrows here, the usage and engagement data. We spent a fair amount of time trying to think through um, how uh, open access monographs in particular are used, uh, and we wanted to think about it as broadly as possible. One of the projects that's summarized in, in Gallon's a bibliography is, is covers a lot of the work that we did over the past year uh, in trying to better understand both sources and uses of that kind of data. Okay. All right, a good a good um, provocative question here. So, <laughs> open access monographs are easy to manage and discover alongside paid for titles. Agree or disagree? <laughs> Next quiz. This one's it. Oh yeah. Okay. Great. Get your phones. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we're laughing too. <laughs> One person who thinks of two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, it's clear what the uh, general consensus is. Uh, how would you all like to to address this, and why? I guess why is this such an issue? I feel bad for Steve being on the other side. Well, I was actually one of the. Here we go. 
I mean, perhaps I didn't look at it as the uh, as a global landscape, but more uh, specific to, to what we do um, um, in terms of open access monographs. Uh, we have about 1,800. I mean, uh, yeah, 1,800 titles on our platform that we do. About 1,400 of which are Decorder, another 400 are, are our partners, and, and I think in terms of how we manage it and communicate it, uh, specific with our platform, it is uh, quite easy. We, we do it alongside of our, our paid for content, and I think. Um, being representative and supporting the distribution of our partners, uh, at least our role in it, uh, in terms of how we manage it on the back end and on the front end, is quite seamless. It doesn't require a lot of additional work from us. So in our, you know, 10% of the open access books that are on the DOAB, about 10% of that, I feel like we, we manage quite well. So I think a librarian would probably ask a question on top of this or, or make a qualifier that's, well, it, it depends what your starting point is, right, or your entry point. So if you say open access monographs are easy to manage and discover alongside paid for titles within a publisher's particular website, the answer might be yes. Or if you're starting at, at Google or Google Scholar, your answer is different. Um, from a library catalog perspective, I think, um, honestly, I think we can do a little bit better as librarians about getting that content in our catalog so there's better exposure. I think for a long time, librarians were almost confused as to should we put these in our catalog or should we not? Um, and having those discussions within their groups. So, so one thing we've uh, we've started doing at Ohio Link is um, uh, selecting OA monographs um, as a collection team. So my, my chair of my collection resource committee is here. Um, so we decided that uh, uh, members could bring forth collections and ask us to put them in the central catalog. So the Ohio Link central catalog. And we are lucky. We have. Um, two staff members that catalog Ohio Link materials. And what that did for Ohio Link was reduce um, the workload for individual libraries to, to feel that extra burden, because we all know tech services staff is not growing right now, right? So reducing that burden on their local campus and having us do the cataloging and putting it in the central catalog. So we're, we're looking at that. And then moving forward, and every February, the resource committee meets every month. <coughs> Uh, review and see are there additional OA collections that we'd like to add to the catalog. So, you know, we're kind of trying to chip away as best we can. I think um, what I would say here is that when we we talk about articles, frequently we're talking about subscriptions, right? So, um, which isn't traditionally how we've bought books. So with ebooks, you know, there have been platforms like Academic Complete, for instance, where, where libraries were subscribing, and that makes a difference. And it's, is that the way that open access monographs are going to work in the future? Or are libraries going to want to say, I want these subject areas, but you know what? We actually don't teach STM, and I don't want those results in my catalog. And I want to do the same kind of collection development that we did, um, that we've always done in print. And it's not just about how much money something costs, but I'm developing a collection that really meets the needs of my students and my faculty. Um, and that's a question I don't think that sitting at, you know, I, I know what I've been asked for as a vendor, which has been a, not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, but I don't, I don't know if that's the consensus in the group, and I think that's another good way to think about the open access. I think it caught on the Yes. I think we're talking a little bit in the presentation about metadata. Well, I'll just throw it out here too: is that there's not consistent use of. Um, metadata, uh, particularly on it, to describe open access um, books. And uh, the inconsistency sometimes are things like assigning the price of zero, which is yeah, an absolute way to get um, excluded from the catalog. Um, there are, uh, it, and these questions have been coming up for a while, uh, our editor wrote uh, a note that's publicly available on the editor website, specific, I think it's in 2014, on how to describe open access books in office. Um, but we're still struggling with getting that right. Uh, one um, observation I've noticed working on Tome, so we, um, Tome works with 
uh, universities and publisher university presses to make books open access upon publication. And one of the things that we've discovered is so when the book is published, or before the book is published, there's an agreement between the publisher and the university that's funding the book to say upon publication you're going to make the book available open access and deposit it in different sites. And one of the sort of immediate problems that we've discovered is that a lot of university presses, their, their websites are not built to display free content. So if you look at many of the, so far, a number of the university press websites, you'll find the book. If you go to their website and you search for the book, you'll find the paid print version. You won't find the open version because the two are not integrated yet. So something as basic as that is still a problem, and that has to be resolved. There are some notable exceptions. I see Charles Watkinson in the audience, and Michigan's done a very good job of that, where they have, you can see, okay, we have the print version, and it's available for sale. We have the open version, and it's easily findable and downloadable. But for a lot of the publishers, they haven't, they haven't been able to figure that out yet. And it's, a, it's a real issue. I just want to add, I think that that's right. I think that once, especially when you look at the landscape beyond uh, your own publishing and your own platform, uh, it does get quite complicated quite quickly in terms of, uh, yes, now we've made the, the title open access, who's discovering it, uh, um, what is the availability, what is, what is the usage. I think that this idea and this opportunity for us to work with organizations and work with uh, various parts that, that play a role in open access, whether it's libraries, consortia, or, or publisher, kind of working together to address this, because this is, this is solvable. Uh, you know, content syndication for open access should be, can happen. It, it's, it's something that isn't very costly. And we just need to start, uh, I think, working together to, to support that. So that leads naturally into this next question, how can we better work with libraries to make open books discoverable and thus engage more readers? Um, I'd like to tackle that. Amy's dying. <laughs> uh, so I've already described what we started doing at Open Link, and I understand that we're unique. I, I don't imagine, well, Jason just skipped town, so. <laughs> Uh, you, when we when consortia meet together and we talk about activities and things that we're doing, we always joke that if you know one consortium, you know one consortium because the work that we do is so tailored to the needs of our members, right? So I, I can't imagine that me saying, oh, we'll just do what Ohio Link does will work because you know Lyricists doesn't have a central catalog, but there are other libraries that do. Um, for us, it was that we, we recognized that our technical services member staff was dwindling, um, and there was a need. We were seeing some libraries put some OA content into the catalog, and we had recognized that there was a need and a want for us, and that uh, we at Ohio Link Central could make it easier and more efficient, and thus um, expose more OA content to our users. That said, I think uh, what, what we're seeing is our students aren't starting at our catalog, right? So where do we move forward with that? And this whole concept of better metadata, I think, would serve us all well. Um, for those of, that don't know, HyoLink is unique in which we locally load, and we have an electronic journal center, so we locally load our articles, and we have that whole platform. And we do the same with our eBooks, and have recently engaged Bibliolabs to work on a new platform for us. Um, and one thing we're talking about is, is there an easier way for us, just from our eBook platform, where our students are getting our eBooks, to more easily integrate with a feed of OA content that, that my collection development team can decide, okay, well, instead of having to catalog it, putting it in the catalog, it's just going to appear um, magically <laughs> by the Bibliolab elves <laughs> um, into our collection, and our students are getting um, access that way. So that's the one solution that, that we're talking about. And that, that's one way area we're looking at um, on the CoreSource side. So CoreSource is a digital distribution system used by lots of publishers 
um, of all types of sizes, etc. They work with lots of library, lots of um, retailers, lots of discoverability channels. And so we're, we are starting off now saying, okay, we need to expand our reach into places where, you're just describing building on that, else, are there places where we should be selling metadata so that this content can be discovered? Can we be a platform that understands the needs of our publisher clients and the recipients? But not just looking on the library side, but also looking on the retailer side. So the question is, how do you engage more readers? Well, we need to make sure it's fully discoverable. It's not, it goes beyond Onyx, but it is. Um, so we're, we're working with um, all of our partners as a server going out to all 450 in the next couple of weeks, asking a whole range of other questions as well, but also saying, do you know what open access content is? Question. If you don't, go to a new class. <laughs> but then the second question you know, will be, actually, so how are you going to handle it? Because you, at the moment, not every platform is able to even interrogate that. And it, even if somebody has jimmied the system by putting a zero into the price, which is very bad practice, <laughs> but it is a way through. Or putting a 99 cents or a dummy price, that's also just, just. But it is a way through. So what are you going to do? Will you recognize this and will you be able to, to showcase it alongside the other ebooks you have? Does that make sense to you as a retailer? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But particularly when you start to get beyond the monograph, it really starts to seep into trade. That's another area we think is really important. Because you want to be where, when someone's looking for something to read, you want to, you want them to discover your title there. You don't want to say, oh, you can only have it if you've got the library T-shirt on. That's not what you want to do as a seller of books. <laughs> yeah, we're not elves, and that's why we're here. <laughs> we would, I, I have people I work with who would love to describe to you what we get every time. I think the other important question that's related to this is our library, what happens to the academic library in an open access world if we're not providing value and it's not in the catalog? And it's just free, and everybody goes to Google. What I mean, does the academic? I mean, maybe that's a basic question to step back from. Does the academic library want to play a role in helping this content be discovered? What value do you want to add in that chain? Because you're not paying for it, right? You're not buying the content on behalf of your patron. You're not storing that content on behalf of your patron unless you're Ohio Link. Um, <laughs> um, so where, you know, what value is that going to be? Is that going to be better metadata? Is it going to be that it's curated? Is it just going to be that, that there's a certain element of privacy that comes from searching the library catalog that, you don't, that your users don't get when they're searching on Google, um, which is absolutely valid. And then if there is value and libraries want to be con in the space of connecting people to open access content, what can we do to make that economically sustainable? So I can say from our point as a, a, a point of view as an aggregator, if we have to hand look at every title and we have to re-massage the metadata for every table, uh, for every metadata record that comes into our system and make the EPUB actually pass through some kind of hoop so that it works when the end user gets to it, then that's going to cost us a lot of money and for it to be sustainable for us to do and pass on to libraries to use is going to be a price that nobody wants to pay for free. So in this realm, far more than in the paywall realm, making things efficient is going to be really, really important for sustainability. It just can't work if everything is a one-off in this world. So, I, I just built a little bit on what Ruth said. Though, that, I mean, this is kind of a three-sided problem, and uh, you've got to, you know, when it comes to things like metadata, you've got a standard. The standard supports open access. It's extensible, so you can adapt as, as conditions change. But there's also what providers send, what publishers say about the book, and you want to get that to work. But recipients are not all the same. Right? So, you know, Ingram is well set up, to, and there are other uh, uh, distributors and metadata recipients that are well set up to handle open access, but there are plenty who are not. And you just have to hit one of those systems, and then you're not going to get displayed. Uh, and it's, uh, that's a problem that 
doesn't get solved except for the set of both the supply chain analysis that we've already seen, but continuing work in that area. So um, this is a question I threw in there um, just because I'm really struggling with the, what to do with ISBNs and DOI in this world we're now living in. So I'm just curious what you all think about what do we do with all of these numbers floating around? <laughs> Um, well, I, I would favor ISPMs. I know that there's a cost associated with it, but uh, it's a highly uh, discoverable identifier in, in an open universe. It does not preclude up DOIs, you can do both. And certainly metadata standards support having more than one identifier, but the ISPN is, is pretty solid. And if you're going to commingle open access with paid content in a single system to uh, discovery, uh, it's good to have a comparable identifier. But, that's, but isn't it true that there each that book might have five, six, seven different players in the end? Oh Lord, I hope not. It is true. I mean, parts of a book. No, books, books made paperback edition. And then you have a picture of this. That's a different book. That's that's not the one book. That's that's several books. Well, it depends who you listen to as to what you need to do for ebooks. But um, there was for a long time a rationale that you should have a different ISBN for each format. Okay. Nothing broke. Just say nothing <laughs> broke. Uh, you could do either. Um, but I agree with you that the what is the if you are in um, in journals and you have the article, you have the DOI, and that helps with cross ref and all of the interrelationships in books. Are somewhat hobbled in that. The challenge is, I think Brian, Brian's identified it, that if you're wanting to reach the widest possible supply chain for books, they run on ISBNs. So you will have an ISBN for each different format, hardback, paperback, maybe file, EPUB file, whatever. The challenge we have though is that books work the opposite way to journals, in my simple mind. Journals have for the longest time, the last 20 years, worked with typically a unique copy that has access, has an open URL, everything comes back to that unique copy so you know what the master record is. Books carried on are on a distributed model where copies are kept on the platforms for lots of different reasons. So you have to have an ISBN because you don't have a unique place where it's going. And that's why I would say you have to have the ISBN. But knowing how the ISBNs work together and whether it's a work, then you know we've failed it. I think, with ISTC as an identifier to pull and work together. But actually, for that discoverability around the work, that's where you need to go. So I could put a whole list of other <laughs> identities. And that, that's not workable for publishers. It's, 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 it's an impossibility, and the databases don't work with it. But ultimately, that's probably where we need to go. Unless you're Amazon, and you sorted it anyway with your Amazon. Steve, do you have thoughts on this? A list of identifiers is not a lively discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you know if we're talking about a landscape where we want discoverability, where we're trying to support all various supply channels. I mean, having DOIs and having ISBNs, you know, what we realize is that various vendors we work with and various partners are all at different stages of integration and of technology. And, and if we're really interested in getting into the, the widest range of discoverability as possible, then and we need to kind of support that in, in, uh, in, in various ways that, uh, that, that they will accept and, and, and be able uh, to support. So, uh, so uh, true, <laughs> you know, I would say, uh, from, from my perspective. The only other thing I throw in on, on the deal, there will be multiple identifiers for different types of books. I favor having ISBNs. But the fact that we have multiple identifiers to me is one of the reasons why our analytics efforts are really important because people will be going and acquiring content through DOIs and through other channels. And, and keeping track of what's actually happening is pretty complex. So just for publishers out there, um, we, ORC 
Pickett is another one we didn't put on here. And, and for books, they're almost non-existent. Almost no open access publisher is getting the orchid on the, on the books. But if the incentive for the author is to get their book out there widely and have it widely read and they want, it, they want all the counts, having their orchid associated with that book is really, really helpful. It's hard for us as a platform developer to justify building that if nobody's going to then supply us with that metadata. But um, So leading indicator here is people are going to be asking for it, so start to think about adding it. That's another one. Thank you so much, Karen. So, ISTC, I've succeeded. <laughs> you can go home. I have your hand now. All right. Um, and here's my softball question here for uh, Brian. Uh, so, what is a data trust? And can it solve the problem of aggregating usage? So, uh, our project was uh, premised on the idea that we should create a data trust to be able to track analytics for open access ebook consumption. And the data trust itself is an agreement, you know, effectively, who's going to participate, uh, what kind of data are they going to give, what conditions are they providing it in, what data can be extracted, what has to be anonymized, uh, what's the minimum viable uh, data set can data be extracted, uh, and it can be centralized, it can be federated uh, with a set of rules on how it goes along, and there are lots of different opinions on how that might work. Uh, there's been significant work already been done in Europe uh, under Hermios and just in other uh, efforts to uh, explore different models. Uh, we got to the point where we felt like a data trust, however it's organized and governed, uh, would be a good way to gather data from multiple uh, proprietary, public, and paid services and bring it together so that we could get a complete picture. The advantage would be that it would improve what uh, data was available, it would allow for comparability and trends and give, and it would probably lower cost for any one entity performing uh, stuff together. So, I don't know if anyone wants to. Well, you might say where you are in the process of uh, developing this uh, project? Sure. So we, we had six recommendations, uh, the first of which was to, to get at that governance problem, you know, not just centralized versus federated, but, you know, how, how, would, it, how would it work? And then to create a pilot uh, and, uh, uh, to, to test out those governance principles. The, uh, the, it had other components as well, including examining the supply chain developing personas, and in particular working with uh, entities that, uh, like the, the several European initiatives that had already done good work in this area and whose, whose efforts we could build on so that we don't reinvent the wheel. In fact, maybe create a more extensive uh, implementation on a global basis. Uh, right now, we've, we've made a proposal to, uh, to have that funded and uh, we're waiting an answer. We hope to know probably within five months. Mm -hmm. That's the best softball question ever. <laughs> All right. Uh, good question having to do with, I see a number of our European uh, colleagues here in the room who have a session coming up next. Um, so we here in the U.S. I know are following very much what's happening uh, in Europe. And so the big question is how do we make sure that we're working together rather than um, parallel or even worse against each other's interests? Um, Steve, you want to start? Yes. Yeah, um, so many of you know about Plan S and how uh, Plan S really has a focus on STM and on journals, uh, which you may or may not know. Uh, a bunch of about 43 HSS publishers uh, wrote a response to Plan S where we uh, you know, basically said that, that Plan S does not you know, fit our profile. Uh, funding for HSS is different. APCs, um, you know, uh, do not work at the, uh, at the, for HSS open access, uh, not universally anyway, and to accelerate open access in, in HSS, uh, we really kind of need a variety of options. And, and so previously I mentioned that uh, to order, uh, you know, we have, we're the largest publisher on the DOAB. We, we, it's a profile that's made mostly of humanities books, about 70% of the 1,400 right now are humanities by the end of this year we'll have about 1900 so we're really focused in Europe about uh, how to how to grow that business and and we've we're exploring a variety of models models to do that 
Um, at, the, at the moment, we have six different you know, models that we're, we're experimenting with, and I thought I'd, I'd share that with you, uh, where we are focusing on an author payment model, um, a freemium model, crowdfunding, uh, cross-subsidy publishing, library funded, uh, and an, an embargo model. And it just goes to show you the complexity uh, when it comes to HSS, uh, when it comes to uh, supporting uh, the OA monograph and, and what is uh, the most sustainable. Probably recently, something that I think we can replicate in the U.S. Uh, we had um, recently we were able, you know, through 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 cooperation with uh, a local government, uh, the DFG in Germany, which is a, a funding body, as well as a, um, a consortium and a bunch of libraries, where we kind of cooperatively work together to uh, to provide a bit, you know. Um, uh, more specifics in our OA approach, where and rather than focusing on just general HSS books, we said, well, what if we, what if, what is there importance if we apply that to specific content? So we identified a series that we actually publish about 50 titles in that series a year. It's German language, linguistics, and we had support where we were, because we had that narrow focus about a specific series, uh, we were able to get support from the from the government body, support from the libraries and the consortium to uh, support. This, this flipping of this series from open access, uh, I mean from a, from a you know, paid content to open access. And so something that is that we feel like this is the beginning of something that we could support here in the U.S. if we, uh, if we start with a more narrow focus to our OA HSS approach. Maybe I could take the, but we do have as a component of our follow-on plan to work with uh, the European initiatives, but maybe you take a little bit of time to talk about the rest of the world, which is not necessarily part of the, the follow-on effort, but I think it's critically important in understanding, for example, what the need for content there is, uh, where, how open access works. Uh, I don't think we have a, a universal sense. I, I had a chance to go to, as did you, a, um, a meeting in, in Geneva uh, in the summer, and one of the most compelling examples came from uh, an academic uh, researcher in uh, Indonesia talking about his own experience in open access. And, and just for him, it was access to content of any kind because their budgets were limited and they, they didn't have any infrastructure to come in the same place. So I think there's an opportunity for us to think about globally, even beyond the, the business models. <coughs> Are you all optimistic? I guess there was a question about um, all of us coming together in our our efforts and approaches. Yeah, I mean, I, there are there are sorry there there are roadblocks necessarily because there are different models. Uh, this is not a country right now where funding for the sort that is is more common in Europe is is readily going to be accessible. But I think we can figure figure it out. No, anyone else? Know? <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> but there's staying away from the microphone. All right, so uh, now to the funding question. Um, and Steve just kind of provided a few ideas there. But can we find a sustainable business model for OA book publishing? If so, where does the money come from? Tackle that. Charles Watkins. <laughs> 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 I mean, we um, obviously, um, as I mentioned, we have a very strong presence in Europe uh, when it comes to our open access approach, and we've been long thinking about how to how to bring that to the U.S. and I have to say it isn't easy. It isn't easy because of uh, the lack of funding resources that are available. I think the competition that we have with journals. But but I think at the moment, you know, I, I think our approach is to just to remain open, open to the various opportunities. Um, you know, we are for-profit publishers, so it's a little bit different than a non-profit publisher in terms of the funding resources that are available. But I think that we're, you know, our approach at the moment is, is not wait and see, is really to be more prepared. You know, what is happening as things develop? You know, we're seeing a lot of things happening in California at the moment. We recognize that the, uh, we just need to be prepared for, for as this 
uh, grows and becomes, uh, I think, you know, gains some momentum here in the U.S., which we do believe will happen, and I believe that we're, uh, our positioning is, is, is through collaboration, is to continue with our various partners, whether it's through Knowledge on Latch, uh, whether it's working with our various university presses, um, where we're just being prepared and kind of waiting and seeing uh, as this develops. I think there's a real willingness. Um, as you can see, 323 publishers that provide HSS open access content on the DDPOAB. So, so this movement is happening and it's, I think it's gaining momentum. And at the moment, I don't know if we, we have a sustainable model. We certainly don't. But at the moment, all we can do, I think, is just be prepared. And, and stay open and exploring uh, you know, new ideas. The idea that we would ever have a freemium model or embargoing our content, we never would have thought about that. Uh, but yet these are, these are models that, um, you know, that are happening elsewhere, that are happening with societies in terms of how they, they provide their content. And I think we can learn from that and, and continue to engage the community about how, how we can go about it. So. to be the wah-wah in the room, but um, I first want to point out that when when our resource committee, the Ohio Link Resource Committee, talks about OE ebooks and OE journals, we, we talk about them very differently, and we should, because inherently um, how that material is produced is very different and funded and whatnot. Um, I think the challenge, though, for both OA journals and OA books is the Libraries don't have any money right now, um, and uh, at, at least in the Midwest and the East Coast, there's soon going to be a challenge with FTE, right? We're not making as many people as we used to, um, and they tend to go west. There's the enrollment bomb of 2025 is coming, or it's in 2026 now. <laughs> at, at any rate, um, I, I think trying to trying to look at this in, in, a, in a very narrow scope of, well, can, can the library just find money for this? The answer is going to be no. Um, and I put this question to um, somebody I was having a discussion with, and I said, okay, if you were the provost, and you had your budget, and this was your pie, and you knew that you were on the brink of potentially having to close your institution, would you tell the library, oh, sure, here, you can have this $50,000 for this content that we, in theory, could get for free at some point. So I think we need to start thinking about it very differently, because changing that mindset isn't going to happen. So what else, what other things can we be thinking about and trying and doing? And that's why it's nice to hear the Reuter, you know, kind of experimenting with things. Otherwise, we're maybe never going to get there. <laughs> I'd just like to um, add to this by uh, saying a little bit about what we're trying to do with Tome, because I think that we are trying to tackle that problem. One of the things we hear about in the, in the United States is that we don't, we're not, it's not a top-down approach to higher education, so you can't get organized bodies together. But Tome is a is a collaboration between the Association of Research Libraries, the uh, Association Association of American Universities, and the uh, Association of University Presses. And so our idea is that and why it's really important to have AAU involved because those there are the provosts at the universities, at the major research universities. And what to be a participant in TOME as a funding institution, <coughs> you agree, these institutions agree to provide upfront subsidies to the publishers for their faculty to get their work published. Is that how sustainable of an approach is that? Um, we'll have to see. But our goal with this really is to try to change the mindset among the academic administrators in the U.S. to understand that if they want to support their faculty, if they're going to require their faculty to publish a monograph to get tenure, they have to put up uh, the money to make that happen. So the more we can uh, get provosts to understand that, the more likely that that model is to spread. And that's probably a start along the way to changing the model, but it, it's a kind of a necessary start, I would say. Yeah, so I can, what's, what's intriguing about this is if you think of it as a perk for your faculty, you know, your health insurance costs are better at institution A than institution B. Oh, well, at institution A, 
um, as I move along my career, if there is a perk about um, better pathways and less expensive pathways to getting my work published, I absolutely agree that. But, yeah. Having worked for both um, Gobi, YMP, and Coots, um, selling, right? Uh, Monographs, I think we can look at that space and say, really, how healthy is the commercial space for monographs either, right? So we know that that piece is really struggling as well, and that most, most academic publishers, that's still really, really a challenge, right? And our university presses aren't funded the way they were. And approval plans originally were blanket university press plans. Nobody, nobody is doing that anymore. So, um, so it is a segment that of scholarly communication that if we want to continue to have monographs, we're going to have to think about it in a different way anyway. Um, so, to me, that that provides hope and really makes um, the open access movement in this space in particular, I think, even more important because. There were, pe there are people. If we just stay in a commercial, in the commercial mindset we've always had, that would never get published because their books aren't aren't ever going to be commercially viable, and there aren't, there isn't anybody out there to publish them anymore. So, figuring this out seems really paramount to saving the monograph. I think. Just answer the first part of the question because I don't know the answer to the second. <laughs> um, I, I'm really mixed. I mean, uh, and I mean this in a, in a sincere way. I, I don't know, but if we don't look, we don't find it. But, you know, I've, I've been trying to do this standards page job after uh, a sorted career in consulting for 18 years, but I've been trying to do this job for three years. And what I found in the three years I've tried to do this is that moving this industry forward on anything that involves more than two constituencies is hard work and, and has a lot of back and forth. And it, this is an industry saddled with uh, what I said to John Maxwell earlier today, a lot of technical debt, you know, a lot of history, a lot of assumptions, a lot of business models that may or may not make sense, but there are a lot of companies, many of whom are represented in this conference, that have an interest in continuing this and untangling that is not true. So, I, uh, but that's what we try to do. Just kind of one more thing I wanted to add. I mean, what's good about Tome is obviously with uh, working with various constituencies between the library, the university, uh, and, with, and with the publishers. I think one of the things that we also struggle with, and when we think of the monograph, we, we're largely talking about the humanities and social science uh, monograph. And the other thing that we face as a challenge, and we've been talking about that with, with our partners, is that really there's a lack of demand. Authors are not coming to us uh, to publish in open access in, in HSS. There's, it's, there, the demand isn't there like it is in STM, and like you see it, uh, um, you know, largely on the journal side. So, so that just adds to all of this. We, we as we think about, and we're advocating and we're pushing for open access. Uh, although we get support from our authors, it's not as overwhelming or it's not so, so easy as you, as you might think. So just providing some of that perspective there. And I think that that's going to have to come top down. That's why it's good that uh, you know, working with the universities, uh, American Association of Universities, and, and starting to accept that you know, a tenured book can be open access and still be, uh, you know, provide as much value as, as a paid book. Right, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. I was thinking of that. You know, it, we've all talked about the prestige economy that, that we live in and how, how do you use shift that prestige or expand that prestige into uh, materials that um, that there is no fee for. Um, I remember reading, I used to be in the arts, and I remember reading an article years ago, it was a study about, um, I, and I was a musician, and I had worked with some, not, uh, some orchestras, so 501c3s, and it was a study about uh, orchestras offering free concerts versus a concert that cost five dollars or some nominal amount and uh, people put more value on the concert that cost five dollars because they felt like, well, it, you know, so it, it's worth more simply because someone's charging more money or the quality is better or something is there. So how, how do you shift that um, 
how do you shift that mindset? And, and you start looking at activities in, in the arts that may run parallel or point to something. For example, the Cleveland Orchestra right now has gotten grant money, and anybody under the age of 18 can get a free ticket to a Cleveland Orchestra concert. So it's that working at the top and trying new things and, and moving into new areas as opposed to just you know trying to stick with moving the money around. Um, the final point I'd make is um, just again about the I, when we were first at Virginia Tech considering entering Tome, I thought, well, the money's going to have to come from the provost or a good bit of the money. How am I going to persuade him to say yes to this? And he, within five minutes, said, yes, I pay my startup package for my science faculty is five times what we're, you're asking for here. This is a bargain. If, if I'm going to be able to support my HSS faculty, because we're primarily a uh, science STEM institution, for him, the idea of being able to support um, the HSS faculty by just paying a small, to him, $15,000 is what we were asking per book, that was a bargain for him. So it's one of those things where <clears throat> if you don't ask, you're not going to find out. All right. Um, the, what we sort of wanted to come to at the end here, let me just see if we have um, <coughs> Let's, um, please, if you have questions um, and you'd like to put them into uh, uh, ment Mentimeter, please do. Um, but and while we're doing that, I wanted to, to raise this question. We, we had the idea here that we've got so many good um, a good range of people in the room who wanted to raise this question of having, say, a working group for open access monographs. Is that something we should be thinking about doing? How would we go about doing it? Um, thoughts? Well, in our prep, I said, isn't that what Tom is? <laughs> um, but I, I think that uh, we've thought about it a lot in terms of our follow on work, and we actually have in, in the um, proposal, not quite an evangelist, but somebody to work on that level. So certainly I would include that um, going forward. Sure, I think I think libraries, I'm looking at Brian, a couple other out there. I think that we would be, be interested in discovering something like this aside from or working on something like this. Because aside from for us, now I'm speaking as a library, not as somebody that's um, managing a, consor a consortia, for us it's not just having access to that content, but it's also being able to talk to our students about the quality of that content. And you know, we see the profession shifting. So working out ways to, to get better content for less money, better quality content for less money, absolutely. I think from a supply chain management point of view, absolutely. I think if we could work together and pull together the standards, that do exist, but encourage best practice, that would help us reduce the friction in the supply chain and then allow people to really start to say, okay, what is this sustainable model? How do we work where there is apparently less demand? But I think actually our question, I think it's just less understanding in HSS, the importance of the monograph as part of the communication. I was in Steve's uh, session earlier and was it, it was the second year that the usage really started to climb for an HSS title. So we're dealing with a very different ecosystem and we need to, I think, to encourage a bit of creativity around this to see what they can do. We would love to have one set of standards, I would just say that. Both about, you know, for, for files coming in, the way, way they're going to look and not be surprised. Also for what people want us to output so that we know we're doing it and we're developing it. <coughs> to one set of specifications on the outside, so. And I think we, I think, yes, the, the answer to the question I would say is yes, in terms of a working study group, but I think we also, uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think now we have uh, initiatives in Europe, uh, specific with STM Books, that is starting to set some standards for uh, open access pu uh, book publishing in Europe. And I think that if we continue to work with these organizations and start to bridge the activity that's happening here in the States with the activity that's happening in Europe, learning from that, 
I think that we can uh, just accelerate that movement here uh, a little quicker. I don't think we have to do it in isolation, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to kind of uh, you know, work together in a much larger and, and global approach than, than uh, regional. So someone has commented here, there's also an OA Books Network starting in Europe. Um, I'd be very interested to know, is that just starting? Is it just getting off the ground? Um, yeah, let's see, Elko. Um, I think I can bring this. Sorry. No, I'd like to hear. Yeah, so so there was a. I'm Elko Fuerta from uh, Oapen. Uh, there was a, a conference in uh, Marseille this summer, and we had a workshop on this idea of setting up an open access books network. It was Europe focused because most of the people there were from Europe. We recognize that there is a global need, there were many people from the US as well, but so so we set up this network and it's just starting, it's not really populated with lots of people or lots of content, but we, we recognize that there is a real need, not only just to have this sort of as a, as a place, but also for different stakeholders to come together to discuss these things from different angles, and uh, it would be a, a waste if we didn't connect and uh, try and align a little bit. So that's just why I put this up here. Well, I would love to be a part of that too. <laughs> so that's, that's great. Um, somebody asked a question here. If there's a the second question was, can an institution support Tome? This is one I can ask. At a smaller level, uh, say, one 15K for two years, yes. Um, we're just adding new institutions right now. We have um, 15, two, two have just come on board, two more have just come on board, and we're going to be more aggressively reaching out and trying to encourage universities to participate. And what we want is, originally, the original 15 participating universities agreed to fund three books a year for five years, so 15 total. But the new institutions that are coming in, we ask them, tell us what you can do, how, how many books can you support? Some have said, well, we can do two next year, three the following year. Um, we're happy to, to work with um, institutions, because what we want to do is we want to spread the, the principles behind this, and the more participating institutions we have, the more data we're going to get, um, and to be able to, at the end of that five-year period to begin to say, here's what the impact has been, and here, here, here's the data that we have. So yes, um, and if you're interested, please contact me. Um, new initiatives need to be open to the core, no new lock-in content or services. Agreed. Investigate. Uh, meaning gather data and discuss opportunities to include OA books in publisher deals. Okay. Um, that's, how do we pencil the university press in? What's curious what that question is? How do we pencil the university press in? They left. They left. I'd be interested to know, yeah. Uh, let's not have another working group. Let us make Tome the hub in the US, but invite more stakeholders in. Um, I mean, that certainly can be the, um, the core of it, yeah. That, that would be um, certainly open to that. Um, Relying on grants and funding and discussing everything to the core kills innovation and the whole movement. Okay. Do people agree with that? <laughs> no. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I understand. Go ahead. Yeah. I understand the premise. Um, I get that, but I've uh, I've been I've held positions doing operations for several organizations, and you can't just not plan. For something, um, especially when finances are involved. Sorry. 
I would go back to the example I used earlier about a multi-sided problem, and this is a multi-multi-sided problem. If you don't discuss, if you don't talk, um, if you, you can miss something, whether it's a library perspective, or a distributed perspective, or to get a company to full profit. Um, the we actually asked about open to the core. Well, that has implications for companies that make their money in this space right now. And do you, does that mean you access? How do we migrate from where we are to where that ideal is in place? Um, I don't have a good answer to it. So I, I tend to think that the, this messy period is, is a necessary precursor. something to add. So I would say even in the tone model, with the tone model, the idea of relying on grants and funding, we don't expect that the world is going to all of a sudden be, every book is going to be published with a subvention. It's that there are books currently in, in whole disciplines that are endangered because the books don't sell. So, but even in the field of, I'm familiar with English literature where the books do not sell well, there are books that do sell well. Um, you know, Shakespeare books, Will in the World. Um, so there are always going to be books that you can publish under the traditional model. There's going to be a coexistence of models, even, even if the tone approach is, is ultimately successful. We hit? Okay. Um, well, I guess thank you all for, uh, for coming today. And, and there is a, another OA book session coming up. Um, I'm certainly going to go to that one too, so I encourage others to, to come along. And um, please, if you have further thoughts, um, please get in touch. Um, I think you can still add um, comments here. Um, if you're interested in the idea of being part of a group, let us know. And um, thanks again for coming. And there are copies of the digital science report up here. So thanks again.